Okay, welcome to the Small Business Boot Camp, partnership between the City of Newburgh, the Small Business Administration, and the Mid-Hudson Small Business Development Center, hosted by the Newburgh Free Library. Thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation on the importance of diversity from Edward Lawson Jr. from Faces Incorporated. The Small Business Boot Camp will go on a break this summer, but we'll be back in the fall with more classes for aspiring entrepreneurs. I'm now going to pass things over to Miriam Bouchard from the Mid-Hudson Small Business Development Center and Sylvia Rivera from the Small Business Administration. Well, I guess I'll just start first, Ms. Miriam, because um, I just want to say thank you, Sue, for the wonderful introduction that we, are, we put these things together, these workshops together for the people of Beacon and um, Newburgh. We're doing our very best to get the information now to help you get started in business, help you grow your business and do the best that you can so you can stay in business. And, and we have uh, my resource partner, Miriam Bouchard of the Small Business Development Center in Mid-Hudson is also working with us closely so that we can bring you as much diverse information in workshops as possible. And therefore, I shall hand it over to Lady Miriam. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you so much, Sylvia. You're very welcome. So, um, the Small Business Boot Camp was formed in January with the thought of giving the community the tools they need to either start or expand their businesses. And uh, we did a few sessions in the spring. We did five sessions. This is our sixth session. And um, it was it's a partnership between the Small Business Development Center which offers one-on-one -on -one business counseling to new or existing businesses at no cost to you. How we are funded by the Small Business Administration, which is a federal program. And the funding we receive allows us to provide these service free to you. In New York, in addition to this one-on-one -on -one, um, and doing training events at no cost to you, we also have access to librarians, business librarians that can do research for our clients. So if you are a client of the um, SBDC and you have questions that um, your advisor, you know, that let's say you're, requires databases that you and I could never afford. Well, our business librarians may have access to these, to these databases and can extract a lot of information to help you with market research, business plan development, um, all kinds of things. So um, it's a really great resource. Um, the city of Newburgh is one of our co-partners for this. And um, unfortunately they couldn't be here tonight, but they will be back. And, um, and also, of course, the Newburgh Free Library, which is hosting um, the, the event under Zoom until we can meet in one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So if you need one-on-one -on -one business counseling, um, you can go to our website. There's a form to fill out. Everything we say and do is confidential. And um, you can have one session, you can have multiple sessions. I have clients that have had on and off for 15 years and I have people that I see once and then never again and everything in between. So if you need help with financial projections or getting funding or um, doing marketing or business plans, um, we can help you with so much. So just inquire. Um, after this presentation tomorrow morning, you will be receiving the um, recording and the PDF material uh, that will be presented to you by Ed so that um, you don't have to take you know, big notes because it will all be given to you. And you will also be sent a link to a survey which really takes about 15 seconds, not even of your time. And I would really appreciate if you filled it out because our funders, the SBA requires it. And also it allows you to give a voice to you as the participant for us to know what you like, what you don't like. And this is how we came up with um, new sessions. People were asking about legal stuff. So we had an attorney last time and now diversity. So, you know, these, these workshops were created because you said you wanted to see them. So the more we hear about you, the better. So um, any questions, you can raise your hand on the, um, on the Zoom, or if not, you can 
unmute yourself and ask, or you can go in the chat. I'll monitor the chat. Um, if there are some questions that are asked to um, the presenter and he feels that it can be answered later, then um, it's, it's, you know, he might just say, I'll answer this later. Then, you know, we're not ignoring you. We're just going to um, answer it when it's, when it's good time. So without any further ado, I'm going to um, let um, Ed take over. You can now click on the share screen, Ed, at the bottom of um, the, your screen. Do you see it? Yes, I do. Okay, cool. I just wanna make sure, uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we do. You can. All right, so no technology glitches. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, my name is Ed Lawson. I'll, I'll get into a little bit more of, about a little bit about me in a few moments, but I wanted to just share as we have this conversation tonight about diversity. Um, and as I was thinking about it and as I was preparing for it, um, I recognized and I realized that diversity is actually good for business. It's, um, it's important for us to understand how it does impact in a positive way business. Um, this evolution of America is in many ways propelled by diversity. Despite the shifting demographics and the impact of those shifts on our economy, um, we understand that this is going to be a part of our public discourse, uh, at least for the near future. Um, this notion of diversity, um, this notion of equity, this notion of inclusion. We know, however, that, that the failure to address the role of diversity in our businesses um, and our various ecosystems is a fear to seize opportunity. That's, the re that's what the research is telling us about this diversity thing. Um, while we re embracing diversity is widely accepted as a positive indicator of social well-being, it is equally critical to a vibrant and modern economy. Municipalities across America that have pri prioritized uh, diversity and, and promoted greater social equity and inclusion um, have been characterized by growth and a thriving business culture. Um, that's a major reason that forward-thinking leaders like yourselves have become more intentional in building a diverse economy and a diverse business and a diverse organization. And this happens regardless of the size of your organization, regardless of whether your organization is a for-profit or a not-for-profit, regardless of whether you're in the education business or whether you're in the construction business. This holds true for all all folks. However, there are a lot of companies that still struggle to materially increase the representation and levels of diverse talent across their uh, systems and across their organizations, and also struggle with gaining an understanding of how diverse affects diversity, however, affects their organization and their inability to truly create inclusive organizations and cultures to reap the benefits. So tonight, um, we, we're going to share, obviously this a conversation is much more than a 45 minute or hour long conversation, but we want to try to share with you some things that we, we, we think that might be helpful in you beginning to understand, become aware of, and, and then utilize some practical tips and tools. So FACES, my organization um, that has been around for about five years, is a New York City and a New York State minority business enterprise, and we are invested in ensuring that all organizations across private, public, and social sectors achieve transformative change. Um, and to that end, we have developed a diversity, equity, inclusion framework. We'll share a little bit about that, again, in limited fashion. Um, that framework is designed to assist individuals and organizations and communities envision and develop a unique, comprehensive, strategic, and creative diversity, equity, inclusion, local action plan. So um, without further ado, I just want to get, get started. And um, for me, this conversation is a lot about perspective. So I hope you, uh, I want to just try something right now. I'm going to show you a picture and I want you to tell me what you see after you see the picture. I'm going to show it to you really quickly. So I want you to pay attention. Tell me what you see when you see it. What did you see? Uh, you can unmute yourselves or you can put it in the chat um, and, and share with me what you see. 
what you saw rather. <laughs> Some of, of you, I can't see, does anybody? I saw part of someone's face. Part of someone's face, anyone else? Let's go with that, right? So I'm gonna show you the picture now. And so you can see it um, a little bit longer and you get to observe it more. And now when you see it, some people, usually when I show this photo, they say, oh, it's a profile of someone. But some, some, some people say, oh, it's a black woman um, because they saw an earring. So what I'm trying to demonstrate through this exercise is to, is to share with you that sometimes you can see something and because of our brains and the way they operate, it automatically categorizes and put things um, through a certain lens of what you saw. However, after you, after you have an opportunity to look at it a little bit longer, you see exactly what it is that, that is there, as opposed to maybe a quick, quick glance and not really getting a very good understanding. Um, so I want you to understand that the possibilities of what is actually going on is sometimes impacted by your perspective and the lens in which you see it. There's another photo that I think also speaks to this point. It's sometimes the case that two people can look at the very same thing and walk away with a different perspective. So because of their lens, because of their upbringing, because of their socialization, you can see one person on the right can see a six, the other person on the left can see a nine, and they're both not wrong, right? And so that's the part of this conversation that I really want us to have and, and get a good, a good glimpse on. Because when we're having this conversation around diversity, oftentimes people are more concerned about being right than being reconciled or resolving the issue um, and coming to some sort of understanding. And so uh, I wanna just share with you some notions of what that might look like and how we can move forward. And so for me, the foundational arc of learning and uh, you might say the foundation of diversity, equity, inclusion includes a couple of things. Uh, and I wanna share uh, some of these things with you before we get into the meat of our conversation. But these things um, like implicit bias and understanding and value and perspective, uh, disproportionality uh, and historical context all weigh heavy in this conversation <clears throat> about diversity um, and equity and inclusion. And, and you keep hearing me say diversity, equity and inclusion. When we started off this conversation, it was just about diversity being good for business, but we can't continue this conversation without having equity and inclusion be included alongside diversity. Um, one of the things about uh, the implicit bias, um, well, I'll start from perspective. You can see how it can play a, a foundational role in um, how we look at things, how two people can see the same person or situation and see something totally and completely different. Um, and it's all about their perspective. Um, disproportionately, disproportionality, when we talk about that, we're talking about data and we're talking about um, policies and practices. When we see disproportionality in the data, it, it's an indication that there may be some influence um, that involves other, something other than fairness and equity. Um, typically, we, when we see disproportionality, we know that implicit bias is at play. We'll, we'll share a little bit of those concepts again, as much as we can get through in the time that we have. When we think about historical context, who we are and where we come from weigh heavy in how we view the world, our paradigm, what we bring to the table and how we interact with folks. And, and specific, specifically for businesses, it really is important because our businesses are drive, driven by the sales that we make and the interactions that we have with people other than um, people we grew up with and people who are not in our family. And, and from our community uh, or from our same uh, body of worship. So we need to understand who we are in, in a real um, intentional and purposeful way. Um, one of the things that I think also is important is the process by which we understand and impact change and, and address challenges. So um, I've adopted a policy, a practice, um, and these are sort of my operating procedures or, or principles of inquiry, which is the, the Socratic process by asking questions. Um, 
and research using evidence-based approaches and then implementation. Um, so it's the notion of um, we can't solve problems that we don't understand. And the way we get a greater understanding of problems and challenges is to ask questions, is to engage in this learning process of understanding uh, exactly who we are, uh, where we come from and where we center ourselves in the world because we have to interact in the world, especially in business. Another guiding principle that, I, that, that you'll hear throughout this conversation tonight are five C's that I, I practice. Those C's are collaboration, continuity, context or cause or root cause, consistency and communication. Those C's are critical to this work of diversity. Um, and I'll start from the last one. When I think about communication, communication is not about me sharing my voice or uh, necessarily sharing my voice to be heard. Communication is about understanding. And it's not even about agreement when you think about it. At its core, what real communication is about is trying to understand where the other party is coming from. That's what communication is about. And it's centered in understanding. And oftentimes our understanding is impacted by our, our perspective or our worldview, right? So all, you can see how these things being start tying together. When I think about consistency, whenever I think about any kind of organization or program or, or design of that sort, without consistency, without a, cons a consistent effort to be um, engaged in the work and to be uh, present in that work, um, to do it one time and not to show up the next time, it's, it's always going to lead to a certain level of uh, failure or non-success. Uh, when I think about context or cause, um, we want to be about and engaged in the work of problem solving, not symptom solving. Oftentimes, we engage in this work of trying to address challenges and improve outcomes for ourselves, but we, we do it without actually understanding the problem or understanding the challenge. Um, we come up against something and we immediately begin to start solving it without taking a step back. And we'll share a little bit later about when we get into the diversity, equity, inclusion framework, what, what we can do and how we can use that and do that work. Um, when I think about um, continuity, it's the same thing. It's being um, always present and building on the existing effective programs or existing effective systems or strategies that we have. It's not just doing things because we've done things, right? You've probably heard this a lot um, with, when, when you're asking folks or they're trying to give, or folks are trying to give you their expertise. They say, well, I've been doing this for 20 years, right? Um, like that is supposed to be the sort of check mark that gives them the expertise and the ability to do this. Now, I'm, I'm okay with people having experience but not all experience is good experience. So imagine if you've been doing something for 20 years, but that 20 years has been um, sort of failure, uh, right? So uh, I, the best example I can give you is an organization, uh, maybe like a school district who says um, there's been an administrator or a teacher. I've been teaching, I've been an administrator for 25 years, but then when you go look at the data, remember we talked about data early, you see that the graduation rate has been below 70% for a certain target population. So their experience for 25 years doesn't really weigh heavy, right? And so, um, when, and, and finally, um, I'm, I'm ending in collaboration, that final um, C, that is the essential work about what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, collaboration is the key uh, to success partnering and understanding how you can engage and communicate effectively with people is the core of my business and is the core of what I believe makes all things really work. We are not islands. We are born and um, engaged in this work to be in a community. Um, that's why I use the term ecosystem when I'm talking about um, this work because we are in a community. Um, you hear a lot about restorative practices and restorative justice. That work and the reason why I think it's so effective and impactful and, we, and people really gravitate toward it is that work is, is based and steeped in collaborative problem solving. You get that? Collaborative problem solving. So 
that's what we plan to do tonight. We're going to talk about those things. Before I move, a couple of other things I wanted to share with you as far as foundational operating principles. This work of diversity, equity, inclusion has to be done, uh, I call it TSA, with transparency, standards, and accountability. What I mean, trans what I mean by transparency is a willingness to share data, experiences um, that provide the rationale for policies and practices as appropriate. Um, the good news and the bad news, um, internally and externally as appropriate. Now, I say that because some organizations can't share certain data, but the data that we can share, let's share. Let's be transparent. If, for example, I'm using an example of <clears throat> the school district again. If, for example, um, the graduation rate for um, boys uh, or uh, girls of color is below 70%. We want to know that because that's the that's the issue. That's the problem. So all of the work, all of the uh, strategies, all of the interventions will be geared toward addressing that particular problem. When we know the problem, that's why I said we want to we want to be problem solvers, not symptom solvers. When we understand the problem, then we can articulate solutions to that problem. So um, that's where the standards come in. They should be clear. They should be evidence-based procedures and standards that guide behavior and practice that may have been used in similar situations. They may not be exactly the same. Remember, everybody is, every organization, every community is unique to its own uh, situation. So we may have similarities, but we're not the same, but those evidence-based practices can lend a helping hand as we begin to address problems that look similar to other, other places and that have had success. And then accountability, right? There should be policies and practices that consistently and explicitly assess whether standards and goals are being met. That just is, when you think about it like that, it's just common sense. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna leave this slide, I apologize, I'll go back. I'm gonna leave this slide with three African proverbs that um, some of you may know, some of you may not know, but I think they give sort of the foundation for this arc of learning and the guiding principles we just shared. The first is, it takes a whole village to raise a child. Um, I say whole village because most times people misquote it and say it takes a village to raise a child. But this notion of whole village um, are harkens back to the importance of collaboration. It takes all of us, when I think of whole, it takes all of us quantitative, but it takes all of us qualitative, whole, to be able to come and do this work as a collective, as a community, as an organization. So I want you to think in those terms of your organizations as a community that's serving a community. Um, the, the second African proverb is, if you wanna go fast, go alone. But if you wanna go far, go together. And again, it's this notion of this uh, collaborative effort and this work at um, addressing context and root cause. And the final one, is an ode to the difficulty or the challenging nature of this diversity, equity, inclusion work. Um, and it says, for the sake of the rose, the thorn must be warded too. And it's a notion that, you know, this is tough work. It's difficult work. It's, it's um, you're dealing with um, people's um, upbringings and, and, and personalities and, and biases. And, and oftentimes people want, don't want to seem and appear wrong. And so it creates issues and, and, and circumstances. Um, I'm gonna share a couple of slides. Uh, I, I started doing this uh, a couple of years ago when um, instead of just introducing myself and telling you about who I am, because I do diversity, equity, inclusion work, I'm showing you pictures that sort of speak to and represent frames of my identity. They ground who I am. And, and how I became the person I am and why I engage in the work that I engage in. So you see, um, and, and it's also interesting um, too, um, because I, you know, I usually ask folk um, when I walked in the room or when you saw me start, when you heard me started speaking, how many of these things would you have known about me before I started speaking? And that's the beauty of diversity, equity, inclusion. There's so much richness in, in, in knowing and getting to know and, and understanding what people bring to the table that we should not eliminate the opportunities for us to do that. So on the far up, what you see on this is uh, 
altar, altar boys. You wouldn't know this, but when I was growing up, I was a chief altar boy um, in in my school district in my in my parish. Um, and I, I I was the lead altar boy. I used to ring the bell. I used to mix the incense. I used to do it all. Um, but how many people would know that about me? Um, the next picture is is me when I was uh, about fifty pounds lighter. I was a Division One college athlete, right? I got a scholarship to play Division One basketball, um, and I have the distinction of being the only player in my school's history to have scored over a thousand points, to have over five hundred assists, and to have over two hundred steals. Again, you wouldn't look at it because I'm a little bit overweight. That I was an athlete when I was growing up. Um, the next picture of that handsome young man is a picture of my son. My son is in his, or he just completed his second year of medical school. Um, the next picture is um, of the St. Louis University Law School. Um, my, my, the picture was supposed to be of my daughter, but she refused to let me show her picture uh, for vanity reasons. So, but my daughter just completed, completed her second year of law school. So I have a son in medical school and I have a daughter in law school. Again, when I, when I got on the phone, when, when, I, when I started this lecture or this conversation, how many people knew that, would have guessed that about me? On the bottom, you wouldn't have guessed probably that I was um, able to secure through a not-for-profit organization, um, a, a federal contract to represent the National Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse. And I served as the community outreach coordinator that, and, 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 and during the Obama administration, I was lead for the President Obama Fatherhood Buzz Initiative that we held for um, every once a quarter throughout the country. The, the, the next slide is, uh, the next picture is of work that I did in implicit bias training uh, through a contract through uh, Dr. Brian Marx at Morehouse University, entire institute. Um, we did training for uh, New York City Department of Education employees, um, implicit bias training. And I've trained maybe about you know, 5,000 um, different staff and employees and teachers and staff um, in implicit bias training. I've gone on to train uh, at SUNY New Pulse, um, Westchester County uh, Department of Corrections. Recently, I was featured on NBC News um, training uh, at the Ulster County Sheriff, uh, doing, doing training for the Ulster County Sheriff's. That, uh, so that work, implicit bias work, has led me into work around the My Brother's Keeper initiative, which is why you see me shaking hand with former President Obama. Um, we wrote and won a grant. We were one of 10 um, organizations across the country um, in 2018 to win the President Obama's inaugural Community Impact uh, Challenge for My Brother's Keeper for Boys and Young Men of Color. And so this was in Oakland, California. He met with all of the uh, people who won. This final picture is my most um, cherished picture. It's a picture of hot water cornbread. I don't know if you know what that is. It's delicious. Um, it's, a, it's a cornbread that you put in a skillet, black pan skillet. Um, my grandmother used to make this for me. Uh, and, and the reason why I'm showing this is because my grandmother was the one who um, educated me. Well. She was the one who, when I came home from school, would watch me do my homework. She would feed me. And this was one of the things that she would always give me. It was either a fried piece of chicken, fried piece of fish, and then this cornbread. Uh, but she would watch me do my homework. And it wasn't until I graduated from law school that I realized that my grandmother was illiterate. But the, I tell that story because, um, and sometimes I cry, but I'm not going to cry tonight. There's no crying in diversity. But um, the... Um, the point, the reason why I tell that story is because I did not know that my grandmother was illiterate, but she gave me everything that I needed to do to grow up and to um, to be successful and to be in a position where I can talk to lovely folks like you. Um, that is what this thing called diversity can do. We don't know the potential that people have, the ability that they have, what they bring to the table until we actually give them the opportunity to show up and to show out. And so me not knowing my grandmother was illiterate and giving her the opportunity, well, allowing her to be an influence in my life allowed me to be able to be the success that I was. One last story I'll share from my childhood. Um, 
and I do this with law enforcement. Um, in the fourth grade, uh, uh, Bob Hammond, who was a local cop on my beat, he was the first person to put a basketball in my hand. And from that moment on, I became in love with basketball. Obviously, it was able to allow me to be awarded a scholarship. And I met my wife while I was in college and I had my children because I met my wife when I was in college. We've been married for 26 years. So you understand this notion of how you have to give people the opportunity to be uh, influential in your lives. If I had an attitude of, I don't like police officers, I would have never had the experience of Bob Hammond. So I can just tell you real quickly about the story. He, gave, he, he was the first person to put a basketball in my hand and he invited me on a road trip to play basketball. Listen, folks, I didn't play a second in that game. It wasn't the point that I, I but I was on the team and our team won. And after our team won, we went to McDonald's. It was the greatest experience in my life, all because of that one lone cop. And that experience propelled me to where I am today. So that's why, you know, I show these pictures and I would encourage you to develop and to understand your narrative. Who are you? Uh, what makes you tick? You know, that who, what, where, when, why, and how. Those questions, ask them to yourself constantly. Ask them of what you expect and hope for your business because those things are very and critically important to the success of your business. Because if you understand who you are, um, there's, a, there's a, um, a book I really love it's called uh, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Um, I would encourage you to read it. Uh, not to say that you should be going to war with people, but it's, a, it's more of a, str a strategy book, right? And so I'm paraphrasing a particular phrase in it. He says um, that if you know yourself and you know your enemies, you'll be victorious in a thousand battles. So I challenge you um, to know who you are uh, because think about it, if you don't know who you are, if you don't know your capabilities, sort of your strengths, your weaknesses, um, you won't be able to be able to challenge anything else or challenge anybody else because um, you're not fully equipped. And so you want to be fully equipped. Um, one of my heroes is Muhammad Ali. Um, and he's, to me, the greatest of all time. Um, but, but I don't know if you know about the career of Muhammad Ali, but if you don't understand that Muhammad Ali used strategy in every single fight that he had. He did not fight every single fight the same way and no one really should. So he fought Sonny Liston when he won the championship the first time. He fought him one way. When he fought Joe Frazier the second, the, the, the sec, the, the second and third time and he won, he fought him a different way. When he fought George Foreman, who was much bigger and stronger than him, he was much older. He called it the rope dope he fought him a different way. So for, so for for you folks, it's important that you understand who you are, who your organization is meant to be and how you will engage uh, in doing that. And diversity, equity, and inclusion will play a heavy role in that. So what, what, we, what we wanna do with the time we have left, I wanna just, uh, again, it's not a lot of time, but I hope to be able to help you by the end of this, have some real common vocabulary around some of the words that we just already described and gone through, uh, but also certainly about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I want you to have a working understanding and knowledge of those words, what they mean, how they operate, how you should use them. Um, words have power and misunderstood words have the potential to cause damage. Um, and so we want to be able to understand and articulate these words, especially in the current climate that we're in, we're in as, a, as a community, as a society. Um, it's very important that we are um, keyed into what we mean, why we mean it, and how we mean it. Because uh, when we don't and we have misunderstandings, that leads to the inability for us to get our collective, reach our collective goals. Um, so, uh, the other thing that I, the second thing I want to be able to hopefully do by the end of this conversation is to help you to understand why diversity is good for business. Uh, and, and better than that, why to understand why diversity, equity, inclusion is good for business, right? And so we'll utilize the results from a 2018 McKinsey and Company report entitled Delivering Through Diversity. Um, it is in the PowerPoint, and so you can click on it and get to it. Um, 
that report, and, and if you, for those of you that don't know about McKinsey, McKinsey is this international consulting company that um, does all sorts of consulting for all sizes of business, mostly huge businesses. They have multi-billion dollar contracts with organizations to do this work. And so in 2015, they commissioned a study and they doubled down on the study in 2018. And so we'll be sharing a lot of information about why um, diversity is good for business, right? Um, also, we'll be sharing, um, I, I mentioned to you, um, I've created a diversity, equity, and inclusion framework built on this notion of when I do when I do when I do implicit bias training, which we've done a lot of. When we view that work, we view that work as individual work, where you're working with uh, individuals to help raise their awareness around implicit bias, and that works in their own personal places and spaces. But to create the transformative change that we want to see in business and in our communities and in systems and structures where inequities exist, we have to engage that in, in a more uh, organizational and systemic approach. And we use the diversity, equity, and inclusion framework to do that. Um, and so we'll, we'll help you to look at some of those things to analyze it, to, to see how they can improve uh, outcomes uh, or improve and helping your organization to become more diverse, equitable, inclusive. And that's where we'll conclude, um, giving you some specific practical examples, you, you know, utilizing the framework and utilizing something I call the 10 building blocks for successful organization to help you think through and organize your diversity, equity, inclusion plan for your organization. Okay, let's get going. So what exactly is diversity, right? What exactly is diversity? Um, research and our direct experience with our customers make it clear that there isn't any area of business that diversity, equity, and inclusion does not affect, right? A focus on improving diversity, equity, and inclusion can yield positive results across many different um, scenarios, across, I mean, recruitment in your recruitment, in your retention, in your reputation, in the services and the programs that you provide, and in your business performance, it leads to a happier, a healthier, and more productive employee and um, more productive uh, staff or employer. Um, when employees feel a sense of belonging at work, they are more likely to participate. They're more likely to engage in their work and work activities. Um, they're more likely to feel like they're a part of a team. Uh, remember that whole collaboration piece. Um, so the mindset of the leadership has shifted from this traditional leadership top-down model to a more um, transformative leadership where you're sharing leadership and you're um, helping lead people to become leaders, right? And so one of the things I, I, I should have mentioned at the onset is this, I'm also uh, adjunct professor at SUNY New Pulse. I teach in the Black Studies Department. Um, and one of the courses I teach on a regular basis every year is Black and Latino leadership. So we're talking to young people about the importance of leadership. And one of the first things that we talk about is in order to be a leader, you have to be able to lead yourself and you have to have the confidence and the ability to lead yourself. And if you don't have that, you know, you should perform a uh, an analysis of, of and take stock of the things that are assets for you and the things that are not as strong and that you need to work on to you so you can build your leadership ability so that you can understand how to lead others. So uh, the culture of belonging can ripple throughout our homes, throughout our organizations and throughout our communities in a positive way. So what, what exactly is diversity is um, important, but I wanted to just share that little backdrop for you to help you understand it. So the concept of diversity encompasses acceptance and respect. Uh, it also involves um, the exploration of these differences in safe and positive and nurturing environment, like this one. So we can have a conversation in this kind of environment. And so you can get some idea about uh, what the importance of this uh, acceptance and respect and what it looks like and how it can impact your bottom line, increase your profitability and your growth. It means understanding that each individual is unique and recognizing our individual differences, not to cast, uh, to say 
um, we value uh, our one difference above another, um, just to acknowledge that we are different. And we come to these, to these tables um, with differences, none is more better than the other, just um, harking back to the conversation we had about two people looking at the same thing uh, and walking away with totally different perspectives. We wanna be able to acknowledge that and to understand why that might be and to understand um, that diversity is good. I'll give you an example of uh, what I'm talking about. So up until about the 19, I wanna say 80s maybe, um, there were two cookbooks or two major chefs. It was Betty Crocker and Julia Child, right? So imagine if we didn't know, we, you know, if, that's, if that was the paradigm of all we could eat, you know? <laughs> so, so there's some food that you know we wouldn't be able to enjoy the level that we enjoy it. Diversity adds spice and 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 uh, to life, right? And so that equity and that difference should be valued, right? And and so it's it's very interesting that you know, and you and you can see that across different genres, right? And as we experience and learn more, we learn that we appreciate and value. Uh, I love all kinds of food. I'm a foodie. Right. So imagine if that wasn't the case. Um, so take music, for example. Music um, is influenced uh, heavily by Afro-Caribbean culture. Right. And, uh, and Latino culture. If we didn't have that influence, think about the music that we would be left with. Like, so we need diversity because it adds spice, it adds growth, it adds all of those things that we love. Um, what we want to understand too about diversity is that um, it's intersectional, right? I showed up, and that's why I tried to show you those pictures. I showed up with a certain race, a certain ethnicity, a certain gender, or sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, age, and I bring all these things to this space. Um, and um, intersectionality, just for, again, to build this common um, language, builds on the idea of multiple identities by viewing them within their social and historical context of power, privilege, and discrimination. What that does is that builds understanding. So we want to see things not just through our lens of race, ethnicity, and gender, but through a communal lens of race, ethnicity, and gender. Um, if, if that, if that, what that means is um, I may have grown up believing certain things about sexual orientation. Um, where I grew up, certain things were a certain belief. That doesn't mean that when I approach someone and I learn about transgender or some other um, uh, sexual orientation that I can't listen to understand before I shout them down as being not normal, right? That's not my role, that's not my space. So when we say we wanna understand things by viewing them in their social and historical context, what we want to understand is we want to take them out of their social con historical context of power, privilege, and discrimination so that we can look at them with a non jaundiced eye so that we can say that um, we can truly listen to understand who people are and how they want to be represented or be thought of, right? So keep in mind that in different moments, different facets of our identities take greater importance, I'm sorry, take greater importance for us in that given moment. Additionally, our unique experiences in the world shape which aspects of our intersectional identities matter the most to how we see ourselves and to how the world sees us. And so that's why we have to listen with a, with a listening ear to understand where people are coming from. Um, consequently, we need to use our various strategies to navigate and negotiate identity. As an organizational leader, that's a very important skill that you need to master, um, that you need to understand first and then need to work on to master because this could be um, very vital to understanding um, how you can engage not only your employees, but think about this for your customers, right? Understanding how your customers like to uh, see things and view things, um, understanding how your customers um, listen to certain words and react to certain words based on language, right? There are all these little nuances. Um, so one of, the, one of the best ones I like to use is when I think about language um, and translation, uh, everything is, all the rave is translating English 
into Spanish, right? Now, we all know that there are the Spanish or Latin, Latinx folks are a multitude of different cultures and, and ethnicities. So there are different dialects, there are different ways of speaking. You know, I grew up uh, around New York City, so it's a New Yorican, like there's, there's a Spanglish, there's, there's all this type of nuanced language. So what we've developed in, in our work is a term and you can, I, I trademark this, so if you use it, you have to pay me. Well, we, we developed a term that says, we don't translate, we transcreate. In other words, we want to transcreate information so that it can be created in a way and a method that the people that are receiving it can receive it, digest it, and utilize it. Again, this is an, ex, an, an additional step um, to understand your community better, to understand your employees better, and to improve your ability uh, around diversity, equity, inclusion to engage in the work that we've been talking about in this conversation. Um, I show this slide, um, it's really interesting, right? So when I do my implicit bias trainings, I ask this question, I say, when Americans think of young black males, what words or phrases come to mind? So um, this, is, this is around this whole notion of bias, right? Uh, I wanna say this out loud with clearly, bias is not something practiced by bad people. And again, I'm going back to these definitions. Bias is something is not something practiced by bad people. We all have biases. Biases, bias is a preference for or a, or a prejudice or an aversion against a person or a group of people. Implicit bias refers to the brain's automatic instant association of stereotypes or attitudes toward particular groups, often without our conscious awareness. Implicit bias by the way, is more prevalent than explicit bias or racism because our minds are like cognitive machines. They encode and store many associations between groups and traits that we have con um, not consciously processed, um, right? That's what bias looks like. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a stronger predictor of day-to-day -day behavior than explicit bias or racism because much of our be behavior and our thoughts are automatic. Sometimes you do things and you don't even think about it right? The potential of impact of implicit bias on behavior, however, can be overwritten by conscious effort. And that's why we're having this conversation today. We're having this conversation today to be able to help you with understanding what diversity, equity, inclusion, and implicit bias and some of the other topics that we're talking so that you can engage in a conscious effort to create a more diverse, equitable, inclusive organization and community. Um, so, I'm gonna say something and, and, and you can tell me what you, the first thing that comes to your mind when I say this. If I was to say, the best part of waking up, what would you say? Folgers in the Anybody? Cup. I didn't see it. Folgers. Most of you probably said Folgers in your cup, right? That's what she said. <laughs> but how many of you actually drink Folgers? Ew. Coffee. Oh. You, oh, you drink coffee? Okay. But but a lot of times when I do this, um, people will say filled. Folgers in your cup, but they will not drink Folgers. They'll drink Starbucks. I don't know why you would pay $5 for a cup of coffee. That's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. But <laughs> really? my point, the, the this whole notion of how things can happen auto, uh, automatically is why when I said Folgers, in the best part of waking up, you said Folgers in your cup. Not because you drink Folgers, not because Folgers is the best coffee, but because it was an automatic response. And that's how bias works. I want to translate. Um, uh, so how many of you watch telenovelas? Telenovelas, the uh, Spanish uh, soap operas. Never? Okay. Well, in telenovelas are produced by Latinx people. It's on Latinx television. Um, but when you go and watch the uh, the shows, only the light or lighter skin people play roles um, of prestige. The darker skin people play roles that are maids and and cry. Now listen to this, Celia Cruz. You, you know Celia Cruz. She was a famous singer, famous singer. Even when she did a guest host appearance on one of these telenovelas, she was she played the maid. So what does that mean? That means that there's a colorism thing, right. even amongst people of color. 
So you keep, so when we so when I say bias, we all have biases. That's what that looks like. So getting back to the slide, right? So I asked, uh, I said, when Americans think of young black males, what words or phrases come to mind? So I hope you've been looking at it. You know, just take it in, breathe it in. Don't get too upset. <laughs> but this is what I ask people. Now notice the way I asked the question. I asked the question, I said, when Americans think of young black males, what words or phrases come to mind? I didn't ask them what they thought of, right? Because when, if I, because then when I ask them, it puts them on um, the defensive. I ask when Americans think of young black males. And what that means is, what does the media say about young black males? What does television say about young black males? What does, what do movies say about young black males? And that influences what was, what we see here. So thug, gangster, athletic, criminal. These are the top five, top five answers, right? Now, what's interesting about that is then I, I, I asked them, I said, imagine if you had to walk around or walking around every day with this as your personal brand. So every place you walked into, whether it was a store, whether it was a, uh, a job interview, you had to explain away everything on this sheet. And that is the beginning of this understanding. And so th in the work that I do, I have conversations with SIP systems and structures. Uh, we just met with the SUNY chancellor um, uh, of the whole SUNY system uh, as a part of uh, the SUNY Black faculty and staff collective that I'm on, um, talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion across SUNY systems. Um, I also, um, as a part of the Guardians Association for the State Troopers of New York, this, that, those are the Black Guardian Association, we just met with the commissioner of state police. Again, around this conversation. So this work is both um, systemic, but it's also individual. And so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, implicit bias. Uh, I mentioned to you that we can't do this work without talking about equity. So equity recognizes that advantages and barriers exist. And that as a result, we don't all start at the same place. Uh, equity is a process that begins by acknowledging that unequal starting places and continues to correct and address the imbalance. That's what equity work is about. And you guys, when you adopt this notion of diversity are engaged in this equity work for your organizations. You're engaged in this equity work and advancing um, not only for your organization, but for your community. You have to understand that your organization exists in a economic or a community ecosystem and you are a stakeholder in that system. And so everything that you do is it impacts that community and ecosystem. So the more of organiza more organizations that engage in this diversity, equity, and inclusion work, the, the more that ecosystem, that community gets impacted, right? So when we think about the social determinants of health, or well-being. We think about housing, we think about healthcare, we think about education, we think about the criminal justice system, we think about um, uh, healthcare, right? Those are all social determinants of health and indicate well-being in a community. And so I meant you heard me say economic development or edu or or organizations in that economic development ecosystem. You're a part of the well-being of your community. And engaging this work um, improves that overall well-being. I like this slide because it really gives a real pictorial image of what we talk about when we say equity, right? And we want to just balance the notion. Again, my thing is to help you have a common vocabulary so that there's no misunderstanding and you understand the difference between equity and equality, right? So when you look at the first picture on the left, um, it's, that first image assumes that everyone will benefit from the same level of supports and interventions. Um, they are treated equally. But you notice that some people have a better advantage than others because of where they started out, right? We just talked about that. The second picture says uh, individuals are given different levels of support to make it possible for them to have equal access to the game. Um, and they are being treated equitably, right? But the third image is where we want to be, right? We want to be where we are a totally diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. And that is when everyone can see the game, 
without any supports or accommodations because we've created the community or ecosystem where all inequity has been addressed and there are no barriers to uh, uh, in the systemic, uh, systemic barriers and there are no inequities that harbor uh, or prevent people from having equal access. Um, some people argue with that second slide because they say that's not fair because it seems to have, um, and, 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 this, and I just wanna make this correction. Um, it seems to have um, worked in, uh, as a disadvantage to the, the, the taller person, right? On the far left, right? Because he got his box taken away from him. And so some people view that as, oh, that's not fair uh, because he got his box taken away from him. Um, and so a better image might be if, because we talked about earlier, remember in this slide, we talked about the notion that people start at different places, right? So that guy on the left, even though he didn't have a box underneath him, he didn't need a box because he had started with an advantage. But a better look at that slide might be that. I just want to give that disclaimer because, um, you know, sometimes it's not clear. Inclusion, uh, again, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, it needs to be all three because when it's just diversity, because misunderstandings, um, we don't get to this part of inclusion. Inclusion is being intentional about structuring experience experiences by thinking from the non-majority perspective. Now you can't do that unless you understand something from the non-majority perspective. And you can't do that unless you get over um, your biases and you overcome them by conscious effort. So again, this is really intentional and purposeful work. Uh, and inclusion is about how you help people feel welcome and safe within your community or within your organization, um, right? That's what inclusion is all about, right? So um, I mentioned to you about this diversity, equity, inclusion framework, and I'm, I'm doing a time check, and I want to give you some folks some time to an answer questions. So I might breeze through this, this uh, a little bit. Uh, this diversity, equity, inclusion framework is an approach to community engagement that aims to assist individuals and organizations across multiple sectors to create conditions that increase communication and connection with the public. And as an organization, that's what you want to do. Specifically, it's designed to assist organizations in maintaining an environment in which differences are validated and cherished and in which each stakeholder is valued. And when I say that, I mean that every stakeholder, your customer, your employee, your uh, vendors, everyone that you engage with should be a part of this interaction that you have in your mind around diversity, equity, and inclusion, where each stakeholder is valued, respected, supported, treated fairly, and given equal access to the tools necessary to live their best lives, to, to be most successful, right? Um, when we use this framework, framework, it would allow us to assist each organization in envisioning and developing a unique and comprehensive, cohesive diversity, equity, inclusion, local action plan. This is specifically for you and uniquely for you. While we're sharing the concepts in, in, this, in this forum, what we ultimately end up with is something that is specifically and unique to you, right? And so we, that, it's very important that we understand that. We, we found that when individuals, communities, uh, and other agencies engage in the practices that promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, all stakeholders, all stakeholders prosper, grow, heal, and thrive, all of them. What we also found is new ideas and new and innovative ideas flourish in these environments and they encourage collaborative problem solving and they value diverse perspectives. That's the, that's the tagline, right? You want to encourage collaborative problem solving and you want to um, value diverse perspectives because th those diverse perspectives are gonna lead to um, sometimes a lot of your success. How many people watch the movie Hidden Figures? That movie Hidden Figures, right? So imagine if people because of systemic inequities and racism, prevented those black women from working in NASA. Who knows if the launch would have been a, a success. Uh, their influence, the work that they did on the launch was critical, but 
because of you know the uh, system systemic inequities or structural barriers sometimes people are prevented from um, being able to live out their best lives and we don't want that to continue because I don't think that the space or NASA would have been better for it. They were better as a result of allow, allowing those hidden figures to at least work. And you know, um, the, we, we're trying to make that continued progress. And, and that's true, we're making progress with diversity, equity, inclusion, but it's not easy, right? But it starts with this understanding of data and doing this analytics to understand who we are, what we are. Uh, and we'll share a little bit about that when we get into the diversity, equity, inclusion framework. Um, we were saying, um, we, we oh, I'll, I'll share in a second, right? Um, but let me move on because I want to get to this stuff. I apologize. So the diversity, equity, infusion frame, framework is made up of three components, assessment, analysis, and action. And it's born on this notion of assessment being inquiry, um, analysis being research, and action being implementation. And notice that assessment comes before analysis and analysis comes before action, because going back to that initial statement that I made to you earlier, was that we don't wanna solve, pro we don't wanna be symptom solvers, we wanna be problem solvers. And in order to solve the problem, and in order to advance the opportunity, we need to assess and then analyze before we act. It just makes sense, right? And so when I talk about assessment, it's in creating conditions that encourage diversity, equity, inclusion, it's crucial to develop a thorough understanding of the organization, in your case, or the community, right? This includes understanding the organization's history, goals, strengths, challenges, opportunities around diversity, equity, inclusion issues, right? Focus begins with developing the agencies opportunity or problem statement. And the way we want to go to do about go about that is understanding who you are. We talked about earlier who, what, where, when, why, and how. Um, we want you to understand your data. If you don't understand your data, nobody will, right? And when we say data, we're talking about disaggregated data. Okay. Who are the most, who are the who do you sell to the most? What population, what ethnicity do you sell to the most? If that's important to you, what demographic, socioeconomic do you sell to? Um, because once you get that kind of data, right, then you can do some research um, to understand how best to market to those people, um, to, the, to, the, to the main, your, your biggest customer base. You will also understand, well, I wanna increase my customer base. So I'm gonna do data, I'm gonna understand that I don't serve a lot of, of high socioeconomic people, what can I do to engage those type of people? And so again, you will do research to advance an understanding of how you can do that, right? And so um, when I talk about analysis, um, oh, well, let me just say real quickly, when we're doing assessments, I said disaggregated data, get your data, but you could also look at your programs, policies, practices, and procedures. And you should do a SWOT analysis of those. Everything that you do, you should also look at your mission and vision statement. If you don't have one, you should think about your values and what makes sense to you and why you do what you do, what makes you tick. Um, you should look at, um, you know, your why. You know, a lot of times we just focus on the what we do and we don't focus on the why we do it um, to drive your vision and your mission um, statement and your values. Right. So, um, and then finally, in the an assessment phase, we also talk about targeted stakeholder conversations. Um, I'm not a big proponent of these town halls because in these town halls, everybody comes and they, everybody is right. Nobody is there to be reconciled or to resolve the issue. Everybody is there to prove their rightness and so or correctness. And so, I, I, I'm not a big component of that. I would encourage more of this type of stuff. Uh, Next, I'm gonna talk about research analysis, research, focus on gathering and evaluating pertinent information to identify the be and best understand your organizational culture and the needs of your organizational stakeholders to set specific, and listen to me, to set um, SMART goals, specific, measurable goals. SMART goals, um, the acronym means specific, measurable, achievable, 
results oriented and time bound. If your goals are not smart, then you're not um, acting smartly in your business. They have to be smart goals that get you to a stated end. Um, also, it focuses on the process of change and the evidence informed action that the organization can take to achieve these goals. And finally, action. The organization's opportunity to change its place uh, is, is placed into a measurable context using a visual logic model design um, and it, over, it overscores the organization's goals, process for change and evaluation objectives. Uh, again, I, I apologize if in the interest of time, I wanna just make sure that we do some of these things. These are a couple of data points. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but this speaks to, again, that slide that I showed you about um, how people view the world. And, and as a result of bias, these are the things that happen. Um, and it's really interesting about some of these data points. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll just, I'll just fly through these. Um, this one I'll just re read. Let, let, notice that last one. And, then, and so by the way, when I give you these, this data, you'll notice that there's um, something in parentheses. That is the peer review article or the peer review study that was done that, that gave this information. So this was the study. The study was that regular weight job applicants were less likely to be recommended to be hired for a job when they were seen in a photo sitting next to an obese applicant than when they were sitting alone or next to a regular regular weight person. Now that's bias, and that happens because um, you'd be surprised um, who bias is directed at most. It's not it's not black people. It's not people of color. Bias. The most biased per people are elderly, and the second biased people are the, are the obese people that are obese. So that's just a bit of information about bias and how it works. I just want to share this with you. This is a, a real world, uh, again, peer review article. It was done by Nextins in 2014. Um, it was a law firm. They were sent memo and they said that the memo was written by Tom Meyer, right? But the memo was actually written by the study um, per, profession, the uh, principal investigators. And the study, they were trying to uh, under, and look at implicit bias. And they said, said that Tom Meyer was this guy. Some of those law firms were told Tom Meyer was a white guy. And, it, and some were told that Tom Meyer was a black guy. When they got this, when they asked the, the uh, law firm to <clears throat> review the memo and to correct the memo for spelling and grammar errors, this is what happened. They found 2.9 of the actual, there were actually seven spelling and grammar errors intentionally put into the memo. They only found 2.9 when they thought the um, memo was written by the white guy. And when they thought it was written by the black guy, they found double the amount of errors. That's what implicit bias looks like. That's what implicit bias looks like. Um, and that's what it looks like in the real world, which is why, but I also wanna make a uh, harken on this point about um, data. Data is really critically important. When you, when you have this data, as I, keep, as I mentioned to you earlier, notice this data. This now is disaggregate and it's disproportionate. And so forever in a day, when people think of black and white lawyers, they will judge the white lawyer to be better than the black lawyer because it is disaggregated data, this disproportionate data, which is why you want to get data to understand where the disproportionalities lie, all right? Um, uh, I'm gonna skip over this. 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 Uh, skip over this. Um, I, I, just real quickly, diversity is good for business. Why is diversity good for business? Because uh, uh, the relationship between diversity and business performance exists. Um, there is a there is a this is this is the data from the um, the McKinsey and Company report of 2018, and so most people when they think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, they they think of it as a social issue, but it, this is more than a social issue. McKinsey proved it. McKinsey says that when you look at or, or you, they tried to do their delivering. Um, through diversity report in 2018, they tried to tackle this notion and make a business case um, for diversity, equity, inclusion, and they were successful. 
the latest research that they did in 2018 affirms that there's a global relevance or correlation between diversity. Um, and in this particular study, they said diversity was a greater proportion of women and ethnically and culturally diverse individuals in the leadership of large companies and financially and financial outperformance. Um, what they found was that companies that were, and, and long and short of everything that you're looking at, the companies that were more diverse did better. They, they grew more, they uh, were more productive, they were, 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 they were more productive because they, were more, they had more diversity. Um, they had more people being able to add to the wellness of the organization and the betterment of the organization. So, you know, we don't need to go through all of these for you to get the point um, that diversity, equity, and inclusion is good for business. Because um, I want to get to um, some, of, some of the things that you can do. Um, and so you want to commit and cascade, meaning you want to um, commit to diversity and you must articulate a clear and compelling uh, vision. And you must embed that vision, vision in your organizational mission and, and purpose and goals. Um, and you want to link DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion to your growth strategy. Um, it must be explicitly defined. That's why I was really intentional about giving you a common knowledge. And the leading companies use this information, that data we talked about to make data-driven decisions or data-informed decisions. You want to craft your portfolio or your initiative portfolio um, or your organizational um, design um, based on your DEI goals to, uh, and based on growth priorities and investment priorities. Um, and you want these to be hard and soft wired into your organization and the culture of your, uh, uh, of your organization. Uh, and then finally, you want to tailor um, your diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives to your relevant um, business area. Again, it needs to be a local um, diversity, equity, inclusion plan, not something that somebody else did that you copied. You need to em em embody this work and make it um, local to you and personal to you so you can mac maximize local buy-in. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here because I, I know that there may, um, there may be some questions. Um, uh, the last thing I'll show you is this. Um, these are the 10 building blocks to success. Um, every organization, if you have not done this, you should take the time to do this. Um, we were talking earlier about being intentional and to create this growth strategy. Every organization should know their program services, activities, and products. Every organization, um, meaning identify the program services, activities, and products provided by your organization. Every organization should understand their culture, meaning the established traditions, structure, system, standards, song, slogan, style, spirit, values um, of your organization. You should be able to articulate your organization's missions, values, visions, philosophy, smart goals and objectives, and they should ring through. Your culture should, should be something that speaks to all of that. Your material resources, you should identify those things needed to carry out the various organizational functions that you need to carry out. Now, I'm going to advocate for diversity, equity, inclusion. So whatever you need to make that happen, like attending a seminar like this tonight, is something that you should do to create the space for you to be successful. Partnerships are another important area or building block to organizational success. success. Identify and develop the necessary relationships with other entities that involve mutual investment to achieve common goals. I said mutual investment because that's that collaboration thing we talked about as one of my guiding principles earlier. Personnel, identify the individual who will formally participate in the organization to provide, deliver activity services, including volunteers, resources, um, fund development, acquisition of material resources that support um, the functions of the organization. Um, if you're a not-for-profit organization, I, um, I do a lot of work with not-for-profit organizations. Sometimes not-for-profit organizations don't understand all the ways that they can uh, gain resources or fund develop. So a not-for-profit organization can create fee-for-services for products and programs. Um, you can go after government grants, all organizations could, federal, state, and local. 
Um, you can go after foundation grants, public and private. There's corporate philanthropy now, and there are other, you know, fund development, other strategies. Um, membership dues, publications, speaking and presentations, products and merchandises, galas, capital campaigns and donations. All those things are ways that you can generate revenue uh, for both your not-for-profit and profit organizations. Marketing is an important piece of this work to establish process for communications of the existence and the nature of your organization to the public. How you speak to the public, who you are, those methodologies, publications, whether it's journals, newsletters, speaking and presenting. Um, this is a marketing tool for me. I'm in a space where I'm sharing information and knowledge as a mark as as a tool, and I'm presenting my organization. And maybe who knows down the pipe, uh, one somebody on this call might engage me in business. We might in, be engaged in business together. So how can you do that and create those opportunities for yourself through infographics, webinars, products and merchandise, press releases, website and social media, um, administration, also um, the establishment of process for the government of your organization. It includes documentation, bylaws and conflict of interest policies for not-for-profit organizations in order to establish a not-for-profit at the bare minimum after you do your certificate of incorporation, you have to have bylaws and a conflict of interest policy uh, before you can, uh, and three board members before you can set up a not-for-profit. Program evaluation, um, procedures, smart goals and objectives. Um, finances is another one, uh, establishes uh, policies and procedures for the management of the funds of your organizations. Um, and just for, for those that are not-for-profits, fiscal policies and controls and procedures, your tax returns, your 990s and your 941s, uh, your quarterly tax returns. I often remind not-for-profits because sometimes they get caught up and not filing those things and they can cause real problems. And with not-for-profits that, that make over a certain amount, you have to have uh, financial statements. Um, and there's it's, it's a A133, it's a 133A form. And in that, you would state your statement of financial position uh, you would state your statement of activities. Well, you wouldn't know your accountant would. Your statement of fu functional expenses, your statement of cash flow, and your annual report is one is, is some of the reports that not-for-profits would do. And then finally, logistics, um, safety, security, and technology. The well-being of the participants and the coordination of activities and resources and your space uh, where you work out of. All these things are critically important for your organization. Uh, and I apologize for rushing at the end, but I wanted to give you guys some, some space to ask um, questions. And so I will give you that opportunity now. Oh, well, last slide, this last slide. Um, again, why diversity I think is important and why listening to understand is important. Um, so this is our education system. This is a quote I found about um, from Albert Einstein. And if you see it, it says for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree, right? And, and our education system, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will leave, it, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. And one of the things that I bring to this work around diversity is we often do that to each other when we look at things through our own um, singular lens and not look at things through the perspective and understanding of someone else, it, it prevents us from actually realizing the benefit of what we all bring to the table. So that said, I will conclude. I hope uh, if there's any questions, I'll be free to take them now. And I apologize. Um, there's so much I wanted to share, but uh, not enough time to share it. But Thank you so much, Ed. Actually, were two questions. One Does is have any questions of me. Yes, actually, were two questions in the chat. One is, what were the five C's again that you said mentioned at the beginning that was not in your slides? You well, said if you don't have any questions, there was one thing I I didn't do that I I would like to do, um, and so if, if there's if it's okay with the powers that be. Um, I like to do this to show you uh, the power of diversity or uh, of bias and diversity, equity, inclusion. So I'm going to ask you guys to pick a number between one and five. 
pick a number between one to five. Don't tell me your number. Just pick a number. Don't put it in the chat. Just pick a number between one to five. All right. Then I'm going to ask you to multiply that number by nine. So you pick the number between one to five, then you multiply that number by nine. Um, then I'm going to ask you if your new number is two digits, then add them together. If it's one, just use that number. Okay. So you should have a number now. All right. I want you to subtract that number by five. Right. So now you have another number. I want you to convert that number to a letter. If that letter, if that number was one, convert it to an A. If that number was two, convert it to a B. If that number was three, convert it to a C. If that number was four, convert it to a D. If that number was five, convert it to an E. All right? Pick a country that begins with that letter. Okay? Pick a country that begins with that letter. Then take the last letter of that country that you just picked and think of an animal that begins with that letter. All right? Using the last letter of that animal that you just chose, think of a color that begins with that letter. So I'm about to read your minds right now and show you the power of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Anybody, everybody ready? All right. How many of you chose anybody? Denmark, kangaroo, orange, anybody? Nobody. I did. I did too. Okay. Okay, I see some qu oh, questions. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear us. Can you hear us, Edward? Oh, Miriam asked about the five C's. The five C's were collaboration. Let me put them in the um, chat box. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't see all these questions. Um, so I can give you the five C's again. Um, can we, uh, I just pull it up and I'll put it in the chat box if that's all right. Is there, are there any other questions while I'm trying to find that? Can you hear us? Hello, Ed, can you hear us? Hello? Can you hear me now, Ed? I can hear you, Sylvia. I, I know you can, can hear, you hear me. Now. I can't hear him. He doesn't, he I doesn't don't know, he's so that. focused. Yeah, or maybe it's his volume is not on. Da, da, da. Okay. I have a question. You got me. Okay, well, thank you for your time. I really appreciate the opportunity Ed, to Ed, wait. share this information with wait, you. Wait, 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 um, Ed, I have a question. Can you hear? I make sure I ask, answer to everyone. How do you address this topic Edward? without seeming opportunistic or overly sensitive, possibly controversial? Is there a benefit being a person of color? That's a loaded question, Pam. <laughs> Pam, we can't uh, see that. Um, well, so I hope that I was able to share um, by the way I did it. Can you, Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Can you hear us? We I hear you. Can you hear us? No, I can't hear you. Oh, <laughs> you don't hear the question. Volume. Put your volume up. I was. I heard you before. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Can you hear us now? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me try something else. <laughs> try the settings. Can you hear me now? You made it almost all the way through without any drama. Can you hear me now? Can you hear us? Cool, How do I? Oh, my girl. Do I, can I you don't know sign language. I, I, yeah, like that's why I did the only sign language. Uh -huh. I know this. <laughs> oh, that's good. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, I should hear you. I don't hear you. Can you, Can you hear us, Mr. Lawson? Oh. This was so well done. This was so it much. You hear me, cool. though. Yes, we can hear you. I'm yeah, I can't hear. I'm gonna try to plug in my. Uh, so remember, headset. everyone, you will be getting both the recording and you will be getting yeah. his PDFs. You hear me now? Yeah. We can I hear you. We you can, can hear, hear us. us. Can, can, you, can you hear us? We hear. I don't know if you can hear us. Right. Anyway, you'll get all this. We can hear you. Tomorrow. You can't hear us. Yeah. Hear us. Anyway, it, you'll get all this. Like, wrong with my computer because even I, I hear you garbled. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, no, perfect. Okay, I hear you now. Here you are. Oh, yay! Oh. <laughs> hey, what a great are presentation. You Thank you so much. What okay. a great so, presentation. Thank you so very much. I learned a great presentation. and enjoyed everything. Oh, thank you. I, 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 I it was a hear, very good presentation. I didn't so hear any time. responses, so I was, I was concerned. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, we were responding. <laughs> you just didn't hear us. <laughs> okay. Um, um, Deanna had I, a question. Sure. I have a question. First off, let me just say that everything you said when you did that, you know, uh, pick a number one through five, and yeah. then I sure did. Denmark, orange, kangaroo. Yeah. It was like, it was amazing. I don't know what, why. Well, it, so what I, what I, was, I didn't get, it, <laughs> I, I was trying to rush through, but that's what bias looks like. I know that there's a bias for uh, Denmark. So I created a scenario where you were going to pick D. And because you picked D, I knew that there was going to be a bias toward Denmark. Now, oh. there's other countries, the Djibouti, um, the country of Denver. Right? So that's what some people say. <laughs> but 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 some Dominican Republic, right? And so when, when I did it, when I did the training in New York City, that was a lot. I was getting it messed up because it was Dominican Republic. But um my my point is. There's a bias toward Denmark. You know what else there's a bias toward? Oranges and there's a bias toward kangaroos. Right. So what we don't realize is because those biases exist, people manipulate us or can manipulate us. Um, and they, they play certain music, they show us certain things. Ever notice that every restaurant has red, yellow, and uh, red and yellow in it? You know why? Go, go, Google it. Google it. Red and yellow will cause you to oh, want to yeah. go eat. It's more appetizing. Burger Recently. King, Burger King, um, McDonald's. Think about it. Yep. Wendy's, all Arby's. Fast food restaurants. They all have red, red and, and yellow. Red and yellow. <laughs> it's like, what is that about? Because you're gonna drive right in and get your, you know, heartburn, right? So, <laughs> so that's but but see, but that's the power of bias, and and, and when you don't understand it. Um, it impacts us. And that's why I do Folgers in your cup, you know. But you said you drink Folgers. Uh, how do you pronounce your name, Miss Rivers? You, you... No, I, I I don't drink coffee at all, but... Oh, okay. yeah. No, I yeah, but I grew up, I I grew up here in the commercial, so... Yeah. I, I mean, when I was drinking coffee, Folgers would be something that I might drink, um, but, you know, but my, you know, my mother, I, my mother, I grew up with my mother drinking Bustelo, so... That's my girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but so I, I said soldiers if you don't cup. how many did I, I I didn't see any hands for people that watch telenovelas. Did you understand that did, did that resonate with you guys? Mr. Lawson, can you hear me? Yes. It's interesting you said that because Lynn Manuel was on yeah. um I, I believe it was Trevor Noah, plus there's a controversy over that beautiful movie that- um, I watched it, it was great. Uh -huh. and, and they, they yes, and, but the controversy is that they are not black, yep. Latinas, uh, Latin, Latinx being represented and that just like the novellas, everybody looks like J-Lo, which is not the full representation. Right. We have all the shades of love, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, One of yeah. the reasons I stopped watching, my mom used to watch the soap operas, the Spanish soap telenovelas. Yeah. And my father told me, novela means do not watch. <laughs> <laughs> and I, because I saw um, Corazon Salvaje was one of them. And I was like, how come? I don't understand this. How come all those people with all the money, they're, they're light skin and all the people that are serving and, you know, they're like slaves, like they're black, right. and like yeah. darker brown. I'm like, I don't understand that. And I, I just wouldn't watch. I just would get upset. And my father told me, because it's a novella, because you know, Bella means do not watch. 
But so you know I, what's interesting about this conversation is early. that yeah. that's that. So again, I do this on both sides of the fence. I can have conversations with folks like you, and I have conversations with law enforcement. And when I have the conversations with law enforcement, I have it a certain way. And when I have it with you, I can have it a certain way. And so one of the things that we try to pump brakes on is the notion that not all police are racist. And you notice that I didn't, when I, throughout this whole conversation, I didn't use the word racist. Because if you can recognize that the telenovelas can do that to people of color, and you're not gonna you know, storm them, Right. But that's why, it, so I want to be real. I think that's the reason why Lynn manuel Moret, he, he got the pushback because of the climate that we're in right now. And so it's very interesting that, because, because. I, I don't know if I agree with that, because I think about colorism, everything back to the paper bag test at the Apollo, the yeah. newest book about the caste system. Uh, the fact that even Spike Lee's, uh, you know, uh, movie with the haves and the have-nots, um, full days. Um, yeah. I think that it always has been something recognizable, not just in our um, um, community, but even in India and even in different other places. Colorism, mm -hmm. caste system, this is something that we talk about amongst ourselves, even within our community. Oh, you're, you're, you're dead on right. If we had more time, I would have showed you a video. There's a clip in the Blackish television show mm -hmm. about colorism. And they talk about um, whitening cream and they talk about, now you know where whitening cream is most sold in African Asia. Yes. Imagine that. Sammy Sosa, wow. you know Sammy Sosa? Yeah. Have you seen Sammy Sosa? So no, I'm, I'm, Pam, I, I'm, I don't disagree with you that it's always been around, it's always been a thing. What I'm suggesting to you is Men, Man, Manuel L L L L I can't you done that. <laughs> he could do no wrong before, right? He's the greatest thing but since he's friend. not doing wrong now. The fact is, is that, and I don't mean to cut you off, is that he is listening and that he is saying where there's gaps or where I can improve, but the conversation is out there and it has, it's it's on the front and center and that's what we like. We'd still love him when nobody is really putting a finger on him. We're just saying, hey, by the way. You make my point though, that's my point. My point is I, I don't wanna put fingers on anybody, but I do wanna have the conversation in context. And that allows us to have the conversation in context. His response was perfectly, um, normal, but sometimes we don't have the conversations, and sometimes we go. So we we go to extremes, and we say, "No justice, no peace." And I'm passionate as the next person. I grew up a dark skinned black man, which means a, a whole lot of other things, right? But I I still say when I speak to people, what does that mean? Because you have to give law enforcement an opportunity to say, "Okay, what do you want?" And if you say no justice, justice means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So be really intentional and purposeful. I want this, which is why I say smart goals, right? I want to be specific because if I, if I ask for it and then I don't get it, then they have recourses. If it's smart, specific, measurable, achievable, results oriented at time now, then I can hold people accountable. But if it's not, I can't. If I say, if I say no justice, no peace, what happens then? Like, how do I hold people accountable? Yeah. How do they know what to do? How do, how do I articulate my concerns and passion? So that's where I'm coming from. So you're, you're right. He, it, it's been an issue and it's been in existence, but we've been ha not having the conversation the right way. That's what I'm about. Yeah, Let's have and I love that because right. that was even a point, even with the, uh, with black men rappers doing videos where all the, you know, the women that, that were headliners were models and uh, close to European on the spectrum, whereas the, the rump shakers and the baby mamas were the uh, dark skin ones. So yes, I do love that because I think that if you know what, you're, what you want, whether it's in your prayers or even on the job, when you go for a job, every facet of your life, you need to articulate that. I, you know, it's funny because I'm, I'm this is a, there's a show that there was this well there's two things first of all I wanted to ask a question because the nature of my business 
is um, it the, my business is wellness inspiring spiritual health. And so I help people go from um, having chronic joint pain, diabetes, um, you know, those type, those type of diseases. I get them from being unhealthy to living a healthy lifestyle without overwhelming them or um, by just making subtle changes to their lifestyle and to their diet. And, um, and so what I find is that um, most of the people that, um, that, you know, like I have clients of different, of all different types of backgrounds, but most of the people that I come in contact with are black and Hispanic. And it's not like, it's not like people who are Caucasian or Indian or, um, you know, um, or, um, of any other type of background don't suffer with these types of diseases because everybody in the United States, we're all eating, you know, stuff that we shouldn't be eating. And that's the stuff that's making us sick. Yes. So, right. And so how do I, how do I break that, that barrier? Because, um, because even like, even, uh, the, the, uh, the products that I make, cause I, I also make, um, body products. And so when they see me, you know, no matter who it is, when they see me, they don't think that the body products are for them. They think that the body products are for someone like me. However, if my body product is sitting on a shelf and they don't see me there and they just start reading the ingredients and what it can do, they'll purchase it. So how do you, how, like, how do you get around that? Because yeah. oh, it's interesting because that. So, and again, I'm, I, I apologize for if I rush, but that's why I was going through those ten building blocks. So, when you think about those ten building blocks, one of them was marketing, right? So, as you were talking, um, a couple of things. First of all, I want to connect with you about like this whole notion of public health, or and there are various social determinants of health. So, well-being, which is what you said is different than health going to the doctor. Because again, people right. think health is going to the doctor. So I don't know if you know this, but um, University of Albany is coming. You're in the city of Newburgh? Yes, I am. There's, and you you know about this PFAS water contamination piece. Yes, I do. So I'm, <laughs> I'm the co-chair of the Stewart Air National Guard Restoration Advisory Committee. And so one of the things that University of Albany did was they got a, they were one of eight communities. Newburgh is one of them. They got a million dollar grant for Newburgh and Hoosick's Fall to come and do additional testing. They're looking for office manager. So you should go and look at this job. Number one, first of all, I want to send it to you to see if you or anybody else you're interested oh, in might be. Job. But, <laughs> okay. no, no, no. But, but, but the reason why I'm bringing it up is because they, uh, Newburgh is an environmental justice, uh, environmental justice zone. I don't know if you knew that. And there are, a, there are a multitude of issues public health wise that are impacting Newburgh. So much so that when they did this grant, it was supposed to be just for PFAS, but because we know lead is in Newburgh, we added lead to the study. So they're gonna be studying for PFAS and lead. I'm, I would like to connect you with folks like that um, to, to help expand your network. Um, i also say that marketing is an issue just because you show up uh, as, as a woman of color, doesn't mean that somebody that markets your product needs to show up as a woman of color. So right. there, there are other and, ways to do that. that, that you can... I've been doing that. I have, I have friends that don't look like me, that are 20 years younger than me, that uh, one is Italian, the other one is Colombian. You know, so they, you know, they don't look like me. So when they see, if they, if they see, they see them and they're like, oh, okay. I, yeah, I want to be down with that. Um, but for the most part, um, yeah. you know, I think, I think once, but, once we I get them you. in the door and they start, yeah. we start speaking, there's usually, there's usually, you know, usually that, that, that whole, um, 
the whole bias about who I am kind of falls to the wayside. Liana, I hate to interrupt you, but for but for the respect of those who um, have to work, work and who need to leave, like the the folks at the Newburgh Free Library and all, we'll have to stop here. But oh, you guys are welcome to continue the conversation oh. anytime. There's so much we want to cover. Okay, but well, before you go, the five question. Leave. I don't know the question I post just real quick and. What you said, Liana, is based on what he was saying, understanding your data and how you can engage with the people who are already interested, but then also how can you expand? And, and I'm a marketing person, but real quick, I'm here in Orange County, California, and um, I'm from Jersey. My husband's from 131st Street, but we've been here 35 years. And this is something that I am in a position to be able to bring this conversation up, but I don't know how to broach it based on, like I said, I don't want to seem opportunistic because this is the temperature or the what's on theater now, but also being a woman of color, I don't want to come across as confrontational nor overly sensitive. It's so delicate. It's like this for, you know, a woman, a, a a woman of a certain age you know, or a man of a certain color. It's just all these nuances are really um, marking everyone's behaviors. And it's definitely, you know, subconscious bias is so strong, so strong. I mean, I can go, if I was to go out and about in my community, which I've been a part of, in fact, there were some relatives that came from the airport and they were driving around and someone asked, are you looking for the black family? You know, that's how I am, you know, the pepper in my uh, soup. But uh, just real quick, Mr. Lawson, how, is it something that I would already put together the objective and the approach and, and, and do it that way to, you know, as a uh, way to get that, uh, to be the one who brings this to my community, yeah. or should I just? Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Just yeah, I think I think you answered your own question. That, that's exactly right. Think about this this way: a script, a a pre uh, researched and prepared script is always a, a good way to uh, operate. When I do it, when I do this training with law enforcement, I talk to them about, you know how you can override your biases because law enforcement they, they have a position of authority and their their it impacts people so i have i have a question for you guys would are you okay staying and just talking we'll stop the recording those who have to leave will leave and then you guys can talk for as long as you want yeah, or you can get his email address and reach each other that way it's a lot yeah i have to shut would, down I would yeah, like the Newburgh Library has to go, and they're the ones hosting this, so we really yeah. have to wrap up. Well, I, I post my email. I'll post my email. I'll put, send it to everyone now. This was fabulous, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ed, and everyone. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Lawson. Yes, thank you. That was a wonderful, very informative, and enlightening presentation. It was. I can we use you see there it is dot got it the outlook all right thank you everyone good night good night, good night. Thank, thank you for you. stopping thank you sue bye thank bye, you Sylvia thank you